Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. We are continuing our studies in the book of Joshua, and we've been taking some rather large sections, a couple of chapters at a time. We're going to do that again this morning because this concludes the division of the land, and it's full of <coughs> cities and borders and things that uh, we can deal rather th with rather quickly. But I do want to read the the first 10 verses of chapter 18, they give us a real sense of the, the lesson that I think we want to find here. And that begins with <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 18. Then the whole congregation of the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. And the land was subdued before them. There remained among the sons of Israel seven tribes who had not divided their inheritance. So Joshua said to the sons of Israel, How long will you put off entering to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide for yourselves three men from each tribe that I may send them and that they may arise and walk through the land and write a description of it according to their inheritance. Then they shall return to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall stay in its territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall stay in their territory on the north. You shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. For the Levites have no portion among you, because the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh also have received their inheritance eastward beyond the Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. Then the men arose and went, and Joshua commanded those who went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it, and return to me, then I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities in seven divisions in a book. And they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land to the sons of Israel according to their divisions. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. In his later years, Winston Churchill liked to say that in 1921, he created the countries of the Middle East with the stroke of a pen on a Sunday afternoon in Cairo. And at a glance at a map, uh, that suggests that that's true and would make you think it was all as casual as that. Uh, straight lines that uh, seem to show no concern for ancient boundaries and natural uh, tribal areas and geographical locations. In fact, one, uh, on, uh, one area on the border of the modern states of Jordan and Saudi Arabia is called Winston's Hiccup, hinting that uh, he was drinking something more stronger than tea on that afternoon. Now, I don't know that that's a, a fair criticism of Mr. Churchill, but no one would accuse Joshua of being casual in his efforts to establish the borders of Israel's tribes. Three times in the first 10 verses of chapter 18, it stated that he sent out a, a team of surveyors to study the land, write down what they saw, and return to him. Joshua was the one who oversaw this uh, very important task. But he didn't determine things with the stroke of a pen. It was with the toss of a coin. Actually, it was with the casting of a lot. 
And in that way, he made the determination. That's, that was the, the purpose of casting lots. In verse 8, Joshua told the tribes, I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. In other words, the Lord would be in all of this. Not just there observing, but the Lord would be involved in it, causing things to occur according to His will. All through the passage, these uh, portions of land are called the tribe's inheritance. It begins in chapter 18, verse 2, where it is stated that uh, this is about the remaining seven tribes getting their inheritance. The passage ends in chapter 19, verse 51, that these are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the elders of the tribes distributed by lot in Shiloh. Now that's the subject of these two chapters. And it's very instructive for us about our inheritance. The events of chapters 18 and 19 are typological. Now, they are history, they really happen, but they also picture and predict the future. There's nothing arbitrary, there's, there's nothing casual about the obtaining of our inheritance. It was all according to the wise counsel and the predestination of the Lord God. In fact, the New Testament word for inheritance has the meaning of obtained by lot. I'll return to that point in our lesson. So we learn much about our eternal inheritance from Israel's temporal inheritance described here in Joshua chapters 18 and 19. We learn it is all from God and it is all about grace. It happened in Shiloh. Now that's a change. Before Gilgal was the base of operations, when Caleb, you remember, requested his inheritance back in chapter 14, he went to Gilgal. But the scene has shifted. Shiloh became the spiritual center of the nation during the days of the judges. It was where Samuel grew up. It's where the tabernacle was set up where God chose to dwell among Israel. That's an important fact for all that takes place in these two chapters. God was there. He was involved in this process. Ultimately, He was distributing the land, showing He is faithful to His promises. Shiloh was in Ephraim, which was Joshua's tribe, but Joshua never showed partiality. He was careful to do the Lord's will and ensure that the tribes received their God-given inheritance. We see that in verses 3 through 6. He reminds the people that they needed to go to their into their territories and they needed to take possession of them, which would involve rooting out the Canaanite enclaves. It was theirs by divine right. He reminds them of that in verse 3. It is the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. Now that's important. That was real motivation for them to act. God had given it. This was God's will for the nation. It was right, rightfully theirs. It was His will that they possess it. And so they could be certain he would be with them in what they did, and He would give them success in their efforts. But Joshua wanted them to know exactly what territory belonged to each tribe, so he sent out this team of surveyors to study it carefully. We read in verses 4 through 6, the Prove, well, provide for yourselves three men from each tribe that I may send them and that they may arise and walk through the land and write a description of it according to their inheritance. 
Then they shall return to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall stay in its territory on the south, and the house of Joseph stay in their territory on the north. You shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. Now it all seems very careful until verse 6, until the end of verse 6, where he speaks of drawing or casting lots. That, that seems, on the face of it, completely arbitrary, like rolling dice, casting fate to the wind. But it's not at all, just the opposite. Joshua would, Joshua would do it, he said, before the Lord our God. In other words, the Lord would be governing the whole process and causing the lot to fall according to His will. That's the assurance that Proverbs 16, verse 33 gives. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And that's the assumption here. So the way the inheritance was determined involved the, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. The surveyors were to go out and record the landmarks and the cities, but God determined the results. Which tribe received the divisions? The exception to this was the tribe of Levi mentioned in verse 7. Their inheritance was the priesthood. We'll come back to them in a moment. And then also the tribes on the east, which we've mentioned so many times, the tribes of uh, Gad and Manasseh and uh, Eph, uh, the, the three tribes uh, on, on the east of the uh, Jordan. And also tribes of Judah and um, of, uh, of Joseph. But these are the seven tribes that are to be uh, allotted their portions. Um, Joshua sent the surveyors out. Verse 9 states that they passed through the land and recorded their information in a book. The, the cities, the vineyards, the fields that were there. And it, it gave the tribes a legal record of what was theirs that uh, also gave them incentive to go and claim their inheritance. And then they returned to Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land to the sons of Israel according to their divisions. Three times in ten verses... The statement is made that Joshua cast lots before the Lord. So this was all of the Lord. It was his gift to each of these tribes. In the remaining verses of chapter 18 and through chapter 19, that the territories uh, allotted to the seven tribes are described. In verses 11 through 28 of chapter 18, the borders of the, and, and the cities of Benjamin are given. It was bounded by Judah on the south and Ephraim on the north, the Dead Sea on the east, and the uh, uh, tribe of Dan on the west. Its territory was not especially desirable. It, it was filled with hills and ravines and uh, it was very small. Uh, it extended 25 miles east to west and 15 miles north to south. But it included a number of significant cities. Jericho, Bethel, Gibeon, Gibeah, Ramah, Mizpeh, and Jerusalem. Gibeah was the capital of Saul's kingdom and Ramah was a city in which Samuel spent much of his time. And Jerusalem, of course, was ultimately the capital of the nation and the site of the temple. So uh, very significant places for this seemingly insignificant place. In chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, the inheritance of Simeon is given. In verse 1 we read, their inheritance was in the midst 
of the inheritance of the sons of Judah. You know, might wonder, why is that a, a, a tribal territory within a, a tribe? Well, it fulfilled the pro prophecy that Jacob gave back in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 7. Because of Levi and Simeon's treachery at Shechem, the, the Lord declared through Jacob, I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So the tribe of Simeon received its inheritance within the borders of Judah, and eventually it was assimilated into the tribe. The next four tribes described in, are described in verses 10 through 39. They're located in the northern part of Canaan, which is a beautiful part of the land. The third lot fell to the sons of Zebulun. The land is described in verses 10 through 16. Its inheritance was in the region of Lower Galilee. The tribe of Naphtali was its eastern border. On, and on the west was the Mediterranean. It's not clear that it reached that far, but it was really between the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee. In New Testament times, the city of Nazareth was within the borders of Zebulun. So this is the area where our Lord grew up. The fourth lot fell to Issachar in verses 17 through 23. It was located east of Zebulun, south of the Sea of Galilee, and north of the tribe of Manasseh. It's on the eastern border of the... Um, its eastern border, I should say, was the Jordan River. It occupied a very fertile region of the land, in the, at least partially on the Jezreel Valley, which is today the breadbasket of Israel. It's called Ha'emek, the valley. It's wide. It's uh, very fertile, as I say, but it's also the scene of a lot of battles in those ancient times. The inheritance of the tribe of Asher is given in verses 24 through 31. It was located on the Mediterranean coastland from Mount Hermon, or rather Mount Carmel, north to Tyre and Sidon. So it goes all the way up to modern Lebanon. It was a strategic location for defending the nation from the Phoenicians, who were a sea people, and the prophet Anna lived, who lived in the temple and gave thanks for the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. She was from the tribe of Asher. East of Asher was the tribe of Naphtali, the sixth of the tribe's allotted territory. The Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee were its eastern borders. Not a great deal occurred there during the Old Testament but during the, the threat to the nation by Assyria, Isaiah gave a prophecy of, of joy and glory regarding this area. In Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, he called Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles, and wrote, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Of course, that was fulfilled in our Lord's ministry. And we read that in Matthew 4, verses 15 and 16. It's quoted of our Lord's ministry when it begins to, to go out into Galilee. So much of His ministry occurred there in that region. Galilee was greatly blessed. The seventh lot fell to the tribe of Dan. Its territory is given in verses 40 through 48. It was surrounded by the tribe of Ephraim, and Benjamin on the north and east, and Judah on the south. It is a hilly region, which is not very fertile, and it has no body of water uh, like the Jordan River or the Sea of Galilee. So it was one of the least desirable areas it was a region that was heavily populated by Philistines and Canaanites. In fact, in, Ju in, in Judges chapter 1, it's recorded that the tribe lost much of its territory to the Amorites. 
and was forced into the hills. As a result, a large part of the tribe migrated to the far north and settled in the country of Laish, which is just north of Naphtali. So that part of Dan, there's two tribe, tribal, terio, uh, tribal territories for Dan, and that part is in the very far north, right on the border of Lebanon. And there the tribe fell into idolatry. And that's all dis, uh, explained and recorded in Judges chapter 18. But Dan is also the tribe of Samson. So the Samson stories happened in this original tribal area between Benjamin and Ephraim. A seemingly insignificant place, but a place where a great deal of, uh, of, of biblical events occurred. Chapter ends with uh, a special inheritance that Joshua received in verses 49 and 50. When they finished apportioning the land for inheritance by its borders, the sons of Israel gave an inheritance in their midst to Joshua the son of Nun. In accordance with the command of the Lord, they gave him the city for which he asked, Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim. So he built the city and settled in it. He did what he told his tribesmen to do earlier when they said they didn't have enough land and they needed more. And so he said to them, well, go up to the forests and clear a place for yourself there. That's what he did. A fighter and a builder. The distribution of the land west of the Jordan began with Caleb requesting his family inheritance in chapter 14. The distribution ends with Joshua receiving his. Both men frame this passage, begin it and end it, because they are so important to all of this. They were the two faithful spies in the previous generation. The only ones of that generation to enter the land. Their faith and their courage were exemplary. So they have a prominent place in this book. Their, their lives challenged the faithless generation that was their generation. And now they challenge the next generation that was wavering, as we've seen beginning to lose interest in the fight. But here we have these two men in their old age, not stopping in fighting and not stopping in leading. These were men who fought and who led. They were great heart and valiant for truth. The chapter ends, These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel distributed by Lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So they finished dividing the land. God provided for all the tribes as he had promised to do. Each had its share of the inheritance according to the will of God. There, that's indicated in that, the repeated statement, the lot came up. Now, again, all of this is history. It really happened. But it is also a type. It is a prophetic picture of something far greater, something spiritual and eternal, the inheritance of the saints. In fact, the Greek word for heir and inheritance is based on the word lot. For example, we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Also we have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. We have obtained an inheritance is more literally, we were assigned by lot. 
Our inheritance was assigned by the Lord. Paul makes that even clearer by, by saying that we were predestined according to God's purpose. It's really an amazing statement because the meaning is more probably not we have obtained an inheritance, but we were made a heritage. In other words, God made us his heritage. God made us his inheritance. We were allotted to God. We were picked by him, chosen from the foundation of the earth to be his inheritance. Now that's supported later in verse 14 where Paul calls us all believers in Jesus Christ, God's own possession. And that is an amazing thought, that, that we would be God's inheritance. And you consider that in light of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, where Paul called us the base things of the world and the despised. That's how the world looks at us. That's how the world considers the church. And yet God loved us. And he chose us for himself. That should fortify our relationship with the Lord. That should give assurance to our faith. Because if God made us, believers in Christ, his inheritance, then he values us. He loves us. He won't let us go. And because he does love us, he won't let us, the base things of the world, remain that. He will transform us into something great, into something glorious, into something worthy of His inheritance. And that's what He is presently doing. But the other side of this is the Lord is our inheritance. That's said of the Levites in Joshua chapter 13, verse 33. The other tribes were given territory. They were given land. But to the tribe of Levi, we're told, the Lord is their inheritance. That's a great privilege. They really were in some sense, and maybe every sense, the most privileged of the, the, the 12 tribes. The Lord was their inheritance. David also claimed that, however. David, as you know, was of the tribe of Judah, and yet in Psalm 16 and verse 6, he said, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. Again, that word, the lot is the word used here for casting lots, determining boundaries. So David then goes on to say in Psalm 16, The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. Now he was looking beyond the division of the land. He has that, I think, in mind. That's the picture that he's drawing upon. But he's looking beyond that, beyond the division of the land and his inheritance in Judah. And he was saying, because the Lord is his inheritance, all is well. Even when it, it doesn't seem to be well. Even when it's hard. And so much of David's life was, was dealing with that. But what he's saying is whatever happens, the Lord is with him. Now that's eternal life. The Lord being with us. That's how Jesus defined it in John 17 and verse 3. This is eternal life, He said, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Well, there's no greater blessing than that. We may discount that, but there truly is no greater blessing than knowing the Lord, having a personal relationship with Him, having Him with us wherever we are. And Paul wanted the Ephesians to understand that when he speaks about inheritance. And he prayed. He said in, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 18, that he prayed that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened to their hope. And what are the riches of the glory of His, of his inheritance in the saints? Now that could mean that, um, that they or that we 
understand ourselves as God's inheritance, his possession, or of God's inheritance that he will give to us, as in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, both are true, and we need to understand both. We need to think a lot about both, about our privileged relationship with the Lord, that we are his inheritance, but also of his love for us, that he would give to us this glory to come, this inheritance with the saints in light. I think John Stott is right that exactly what it will be like is beyond our capacity to imagine. Now, that's certainly true. We cannot begin to imagine the greatness of the inheritance that we will obtain, that we will enter into for all eternity. And nor can we understand the greatness of, of being in a relationship with the Lord, of, of us being His inheritance. Nevertheless, we need to, to think on these things, and the Lord has given us some revelation about them so that we can think to some degree about them. And even what he's given us, which is very limited, is enough to occupy our thinking and our meditation for the rest of our lives. It's what the Lord spoke of in Matthew chapter 19. Our future is, verse 28, he spoke of the, resur the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne and the apostles will sit with him on thrones judging the, the tribes of Israel. Now that's the future. That's the kingdom to come. But this description in this one word, regeneration, is very significant. It's evocative. It makes you think a lot beyond just that word. It, it, it doesn't tell us a lot, I, I will say, but it does tell us enough to know that that world that we are going to enter into is not like this one. It will be transformed. It will be transformed gloriously. It will be paradise regained. It will be a time of peace. It will be a time of prosperity. It's described in Isaiah chapter 2 as an age when warriors will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and they'll learn war no more. Learning, though, will be universal. People from all over the globe will go up to the mountain of the Lord to be taught His ways. They will learn righteousness, and they will embrace righteousness. That's a, 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 a great change from what we are experiencing in our day where the, the moral boundaries are very fluid. Well, they won't be then. Righteousness will be established, not just outwardly, but it will be established when the, within the hearts of the people. They will long for that and they will conform to that. In Isaiah 11, it's, it's, it is described as an age when the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Well, these are images that give us an impression of a golden age that, that the world has not known since the Garden of Eden. And I think it only knew it then, briefly. But it will eclipse that. It will be what the Garden of Eden could have become had Adam not sinned. But it's not the end. Now, I'm a, a convinced, firm premillennialist. But there's something that's going to follow that. And uh, maybe better to say that the millennial kingdom will be transformed into something even greater. It will be transformed into the eternal state the new heavens and the new earth of Revelation chapter 21 and 22, when sin and death will no longer exist. It will be forever and ever. World without end, as Paul speaks of it in Ephesians 3 verse 21, in which glory, knowledge, and joy only increase exponentially and endlessly it's our inheritance. 
In the meantime, we live in the here and now. We live in a fallen world with sin, sickness, and death. We are pilgrims passing through a world occupied by the enemy. But we're to live in this world, in this world as ambassadors of Christ. And we have been equipped to do that. In Ephesians 1 verse 14, when Paul speaks of, of the inheritance, he says that we've been given a pledge. It's the Holy Spirit. That word pledge is an interesting word. It's a colorful word. It's got a lot of history behind it. It was used of an engagement ring. It uh, here is a, a down payment. That's how Paul is using it with that sense. A deposit or a first installment of the full amount which would come later. So it's the guarantee that the full amount, the full inheritance will come which is also the assurance that we are absolutely secure in this world until it does come. We have the Holy Spirit who not only guarantees the full inheritance in the future, but in the present is giving us out of that inheritance now with a constant supply of spiritual life, faith, and power to obey. Paul gives similar encouragement in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, again reminding us that we are heirs of God with a glorious inheritance. He wrote, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Well, that's our life now. We are not unequipped for this world, this hostile world. Every believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit confirms with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs. He gives us that assurance. So we can be confident in our faith and confident in the Lord's love for us and that we live in His power, the power of the Lord, so that as we live by faith and as we obey the Lord day by day, He will bless us and He'll give success to our lives. And that's the battle we fight. Our sword is the Word of God. Our sword, our weapon, is the truth of God. It is as we speak the truth, give the gospel according to the wisdom the Spirit gives, and, and live that truth, the truth of the gospel, according to the power that the Spirit gives, that we succeed, that we, to use the imagery of this book of Joshua, that we conquer Canaanites in this world the spiritual Canaanites that we see all around us. It's through the Word of God, thinking it, believing it, acting upon it, living it. As new creatures in Christ, we are indwelt by the third person of the Trinity. We have resources and abilities that go far beyond the natural. I often say we live a supernatural life. We do. Though oftentimes we don't live up to that. We actually live below that. In fact, I would say we always do that, unfortunately. Dr. Don Campbell, in his study on the book of Joshua, wrote that some years ago, newspapers carried the story of a search on Chicago's Skid Row, which is the, if you're not familiar with that term, the, uh, the slums of Chicago. The search was for a British man who was the sole heir of $12 million. Now, if this was decades ago, if this was in the 1930s, as I suspect it was, then that was far more valuable than $12 million. You could probably double or triple that. 
You know, the situation was terrible. He had access to great wealth, was legally a wealthy man, but lived in abject poverty because he didn't know the wealth that he possessed. And as Dr. Campbell points out, and as is obvious from the illustration, Christians live like that. We all do. We have a glorious inheritance beyond anything that we can fathom. But also we have a pledge now we have a down payment, and we need to live on that. We need to live like it. Now, I'm not speaking of, of material prosperity or physical health. I'm sure you know that. I'm speaking of a, a spiritually fruitful life of inner transformation, one of love and joy and peace, even in times of trial and privation. It's as we mature in wisdom and knowledge, uh, as, as the inner man grows while the outer man is decaying, it's as we grow in that way that we shine as lights and we overcome sin and become a blessing to those around us. Now that's being a spiritual Joshua and spiritual Caleb. Real warriors for the Lord in the, the largely for us, largely unseen, unheralded spiritual battles of, of life. Uh, that's where we live, in this invisible war. Uh, people don't see it. People don't know what you go through or I go through, what we all go through every moment. We're fighting various battles, and this is how we do it. Through the Spirit, by the Spirit's power, and with the hope of the world to come, always with that before us. That these things are temporal, but the things we do in this life have eternal consequences and great and glorious reward. But what that, herit that, uh, that uh, inheritance that we see here in the book of Joshua prefigured, what it uh, pictured will, will last. That which we have will last. This world does not last. But the world that we will inherit is a world without end. And so that's what we're to live for, as I say. That's what lasts. And living for it, living for Christ, is the greatest way to do that, the greatest way to live. It's the greatest way and really the only way to be a blessing in the midst of this world. If you're here without Christ... Know that you have nothing that will last. Your possessions won't last. Your, your wealth won't last. Your, your life won't last. We are a vapor, James said. Come to Christ. Trust in Him for salvation as the eternal Son of God who came to save the lost and did it by dying in their place, suffering their punishment so that they would have life through Him, through faith in Him. Come to Christ and believe in Him. i got to help you to do that and help all of us to rejoice in who we are in Christ and what we have, the glorious future that's ours. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for the picture that this passage gives us. <clears throat> It tells us, first of all, that you're faithful to your people. You are faithful to Israel, to the 12 tribes. You gave them each an inheritance according to your will. You fulfilled your promises to them. And yet that just pictures the greater inheritance that we have. And we have a glorious future. And it is certain. And help us to remember that and to live in light of that. This world is passing away, but that world will never pass away. It is a world without end. We thank you that you have made us citizens of it through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, as we will take the Lord's Supper, we pray that you remind us of all that he did for us, that gain, that great inheritance that we have. Bless us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the adult Sunday school class, uh, parallel with uh, Mike Black's exposition of the 
Proverbs, we've been studying the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, and we're actually nearing the end of that study, where in the seventh chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 13, Jesus pleads the urgency of making the decision to trust in him and believe in him and become a disciple of him. And he likens the choice to two ways and two gates. Enter through the narrow gate, he says, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now I read that uh, this morning uh, as we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper, uh, merely to make the point that the Lord's Supper is for the Lord's people. Uh, It was intended by our Lord to be an ongoing means for all those who have entered through the narrow way to remember his sacrifice and and death on the cross that provided the gate to forgiveness and life forever in heaven with him. We welcome all who are here uh, this morning and who are live streaming with us Uh, We're glad you've all had the opportunity to hear uh, the ministry of the Word as Dan has brought it before us this morning, and we hope that you'll continue uh, to join us every Sunday. But we also uh, humbly uh, want to suggest, if you have not yet become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you simply let the offered bread of the Lord's Supper and the cup of wine pass by. Our participation in the Lord's Supper is a gift given to us by God. It is all His grace. And our desire for you is that you receive His free gift yourself. It's simply through the narrow gate. You cannot take your good works in with you, your reputation in the marketplace or in your community. You can't take your money in with you. You can't to even take your attendance in church in with you. The gate is Christ and the work of salvation he accomplished. And the path there is narrow, Jesus said, uh, but it leads uh, someplace glorious. It leads to life with him, the forgiveness of our sins and untarnished communion with our God. It leads as we've just heard from Dan, to this privileged relationship, uh, that, that, that this inheritance that is ours, that's where the gate lives. And this is illustrated now in the substance of the Lord's Supper, in that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body, given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took uh, the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we eat and as we drink, we remember that Jesus offered himself in our place an atoning sacrifice for sin so that we might enter in and receive his free gift, the inheritance that is ours. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we do bow before you with grateful hearts and say thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have now, all, as I said, uh, of grace. Uh, We're undeserving, any of us in this room, to take of this bread and in obedience to the Lord Jesus, uh, eat it, uh, signifying that we have taken hold of this free gift. Uh, But we thank you for it. We thank you especially for what it reminds us of and is intended to symbolize uh, that Jesus, your son from eternity past, took on flesh and blood and offered himself a sacrifice for the sins of those he came to save. In his name, amen. 
I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, which is a very important verse for two reasons, at least, in terms of our motivation in the Christian life, and also the nature of the atonement, the nature of the death of Christ, that it actually saved, it didn't provide salvation, it didn't make men merely savable, hypothetically, it is where we were saved, purchased for the Lord. And I'll speak of that in a moment. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. So what Paul is saying here is at the cross, Christ saved us, as I just said. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter said that Christ bore our sins so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So both Peter and Paul are saying that the death of the old fallen person that we were occurred at the cross. That's where we died with Christ when he died. That's where he gained our salvation which is to say, the cross saves. Now that raises a question. What does it mean that he died for all, therefore all died? If all means, as so many think, that it's all who ever lived, all meaning everyone, the entire human population, then isn't that universalism? Well, this is... Maybe one of the main texts that those who believe in universalism, that all will be saved, appeal to. Because if this is all we had in Scripture, we might draw that conclusion very reasonably. But of course, that's not correct. We know that from all of Scripture. We interpret Scripture with Scripture, and that would exclude it. And that's not Paul's meaning. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian, explained it well in his commentary. He wrote very simply, Christ died for the all who died when he died. Now that's something you may have to think about for a moment, but I'll read it again. Christ died for the all who died when he died. Who died when Christ died? All whom the Father gave him to save. All those he represented. He came to save the elect. He came to die for the sheep. And so, it's all of His people, all from every nation of the world. At the cross, He accomplished redemption for His people. He bought us all and secured our salvation. And in time, in each generation, the Holy Spirit applies that salvation through, to His people, producing faith so that we lay hold of Him. That's a way of saying salvation is of the Lord. It's altogether His work. All the glory goes to the great triune God. He, the Father, chose a people for Himself. Christ, the Son, executed that plan and came and accomplished it. And the Spirit of God applies it in each generation to a great host of people. And we're reminded of that here as we take this cup it speaks of the death of Christ, speaks of the blood He shed for us. And it should, as we think about it, compel us to live a life of gratitude for Him. He came for the select purpose of saving you, His children, His sheep. And that should produce thanksgiving within us. Well, let's give thanks for the cup that speaks of His sacrifice for us. Father, we do thank You for sending your Son into the world to die for us, and in dying for us, actually obtaining us for you, buying us for you, buying us out of, as it were, the slave market of spiritual sin and death, and bringing us into your family. Thank you for him and for what we have. And do, Lord, we pray, compel us to live a life of service out of love for him, out of love for the triune God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's conclude with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Till next week, the Lord make His face to shine upon you, I hope, and keep you looking to Christ and bring you back here safely. Have a good week. Bye.